everyone. It's Tina McGlynn with another episode of Life and Stories. And today, I basically kidnapped this guy out of a clubhouse room yesterday. <laughs> I am speaking with Nicholas Heilig, and he is coming to us from Colorado, who is quite the interesting artist, and I think about a couple other things he's got going on. But hey, Nick, how are you? Our hey, Tina. So, it's so, so good to be with you. So yeah. good to be with you. I'm great. What's going on? Just hanging out, you know, I um, recently been kind of diving into this metaverse space. And so there's, I've been doing a whole bunch of learning and it, it feels like my mind has expanded in the past two months more than it has in the past five years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what's going on? Like, tell us, um, I know we just kind of talked about a little bit of some of the art you're doing. So um, can yeah. you tell me about that? Like what, what art um, you do and, and what, you know, what you've done. So tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love I love to talk about myself and my art. Um, so kind of for the past 10 years, I've been primarily focused on uh, performance painting with uh, bands and various DJs. Um, I worked with some people that uh, people might recognize, uh, Twiddle, Modest Yahoo, Damian Marley, um, just a, a whole wide range of genres um, and styles. Uh, and kind of when COVID hit America, I was um, already contemplating taking a year break away from oh. festival touring. Okay. Um, being on the road is tough, and I'm sure a lot of bands can relate to this. Um, trying to write new material and record new material while you're touring is incredibly difficult. Um, so I was kind of feeling a transition anyway. And uh, yeah, the whole COVID situation kind of forced my hand. Um, which was, you know, honestly a little bit nice because I didn't have the fear of missing out since all the shows were shut down. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually very, very grateful and thankful that, you know, the universe kind of aligned with my own wishes. Um, funny how that works. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's, you know, I never know whether to, um, to not chalk it up to coincidence, but kind of you know, just chalk it up to the things I'm paying attention to. Maybe there's a reason I'm seeing the pattern. Yeah. Um, but I do think as an artist, that's kind of what we're all about is cluing into what patterns are there, recognizing how we can, um, you know, put our spin on it, but, but base it on that truthful pattern that always exists. Like that. And so um, where, do, where were you doing this performance art? Like mainly are an arena? Tell me, tell me how this works. Cause I'm not quite... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I started, I was in Burlington, Vermont. It was shortly after I got out of college and I was just working with a couple of uh, DJ friends and local bands. So it was mostly um, mostly like dive bars. Occasionally it would be like the big music venue that's in town, which is called Higher Ground. Okay. Um, but we did a lot of shows at uh, the Half Lounge and Nectar's Vermont is a little um, pretty famous bar in Burlington, Vermont mm -hmm. that has put on a lot of uh, bands for their first time. Um, so it kind of started there and then I just snowballed it. I started taking videotape of me performing with these smaller acts oh, okay. and sh shopping it around to some larger bands. Um, so I, I eventually um, connected with Twiddle and they kind of brought me on for a whole uh, Colorado tour in 2015 wow. in the winter time. Um, and we did, uh, I went, I was actually on tour with them and we did um, 10 shows in 12 days. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crisscrossing the state. It wasn't in a nice orderly <laughs> circle pattern at all. We like went down to Telluride and then back up to like Fort Collins and then out on 70. It was ridiculous. Wow. Um, but it was, yeah, it was amazing experience. I made super good friends with the whole crew. Um, and so that was a lot of uh, smaller Colorado venues. But then I've also, since then, I've painted on stage at Red Rocks. Oh, um man. The House of Blues in Boston, uh, a whole bunch of incredible venues have, have let me do my thing. So I consider myself very grateful. Wow. I've been to Red Rocks twice. I um, went out there. I was out there for a conference down in uh, downtown Denver, and I actually took a day off. I was supposed to be in some meetings, and I told my husband, screw that. <laughs> He went, you know, because uh, we went all over the place. And then when I took my son out, uh, when I first met my CBD company, you know, I took him up to Red Rock because I knew he'd enjoy it. And the interestingly thing, the last concert I was at may have been in Colorado. I'm trying to remember. It's because, you know, concerts, <laughs> we haven't had any. But um, yeah. what led you to doing something like that? What Was it from college or something you've liked 
wanted to do all your life? Like, how did this yeah. come about? Yeah, sure. So before I forget, I just want to mention this piece. I know, I love here. it. It's the first thing um, I noticed. <laughs> uh, Fish Boombox. It was actually done live at Red Rocks uh, with a, a DJ uh, band called uh, Boombox. Okay. So it's kind of two guys that run it. One guy plays the guitar and they play beats and it's it's really awesome. awesome. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, that was the first thing I asked you. What is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, so he's cool. a fun little guy. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I um, honestly, I was, I was, making music uh, I was involved in the hip-hop community in Vermont which is a little bit sometimes when I mention that people are surprised that there's a hip-hop community in Vermont okay. um, but it, it really is a, a strong scene um, compared to other places I've been there they have there's deep roots and there's wow. a there's a supportive community for it um, so actually my best friend uh, who I made through just skateboarding okay. uh, was a scratch DJ oh, okay. so we started doing just a fun hip hop project where I was emceeing and he was scratching. Um, and then I was asked by another uh, college friend of mine to emcee for a dubstep collective. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Now, dubstep, I know everything um, you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the funny thing about dubstep is we got into it maybe a year or two before it went mainstream in America. Like wow. my my buddy was he was into it. Right. He's really deep into the music scene and knowledgeable. Um, so we got in a little bit early and it was, it must've been 10 years after it was big in, in England. So it wasn't like we were cutting edge either, but people in America were, we were on board the hype train, like right as it exploded. Um, and I never really liked dance music too much. So for me, it was super fun to have an outlet where it was popular and it was dance music and everyone liked it. I was like, oh, and I can, I can handle this. Like, okay, this is, this is awesome. Um, and one night they just had a big show and they asked me to paint um, because the DJ knew I was in school for studio art. Okay. Um, yeah. So I kind of, I always knew I was, um, I was always involved with artwork from a young age and I knew I always wanted to pursue the career. Um, I found pursuing the fine art scene in Burlington, Vermont as a young college student, very difficult. I couldn't really relate to most of the collectors that are in okay. that scene. Okay. Um, and I saw, I did see a big difference when I moved out to Denver in that it has been much easier for me to market my artwork because I believe that, um, you know, my market, the people that would be interested in my work is living in Denver oh, largely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been really amazing, but the whole, um, transition into it, I really, my friends just asked me to do it and everybody was loving it and it, it was the most viable thing I could do at the time. And so I kind of just jumped full steam into it. Um, and after doing a, a tour or two doing festivals, I started to put together like actual tour posters oh, and, wow. okay. and book out the festivals ahead of time. Okay. Um, so for, for nine years, I've done um, May till September, every weekend at a different music festival, usually in a different state. Wow. Um, and then I'll do one or two shows during the week in between there, like wherever I'm traveling to. So if you're, if you're um, producing posters, does that mean do you have like a website or something where people after the fact can go and purchase this artwork? Is that how that kind of works? Yeah. So part of me taking the break or the plan break was yeah. trying to catch up on that work. Yeah. Okay. Um, my least, my least favorite part is taking a photograph, digitizing it mm -hmm. and touching it up. So it can, so the print or reproduction can look correct. <laughs> um, it does take quite a bit of time God, and yeah. I, I, I think my biggest obstacle is my patience with pieces by the time I've drawn it once or twice I'm really over it I want to move on to a new subject <laughs> yeah um, so you need somebody you kind of need like that person to do the admin work or the whatever it's called in, in our world so, so yeah, you know yeah. I'm going to ask the obvious question when we talk about digitizing art do you yeah. have NFTs <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, of course. So, well, one just to speak to your your first point there, I do plan on hiring an intern soon to take Good. care of all my social medias. Yeah. Um, all my all my social media handles are either Heilig or Heilig Art. Um, so that's H E I L I G. Very easy to find. Heiligart at Gmail, Heiligart.com, Instagram, all that stuff. Great. Um, so there's consistency so we can find you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, the one exception would be for my NFTs. Um, my Showtime handle doesn't show up yet because I have okay. not minted. Um, but it will show up once I have minted. And my Showtime handle is just high, H-I. 
So tell um, me about that. Cause you may, we may be, um, there might be people like me that are so brand new to NFT that don't understand what you just said, like what that means. So tell me about yeah. what minting means, how this all works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've been researching these NFTs for a good month now. Okay. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to jump on board right away mm -hmm. as everyone did, because it was kind of <laughs> like, yeah, catch the train, be early, yeah. early adopter, get in. Yeah. Um, but there were some issues uh, surrounding like the ecological impacts. Uh -huh. And I, I think some of those stories, um, honestly, you have to consider who the story is coming from. And I think it was, you know, a bit of the, the, the kettle calling the pot black in, in a, you know, the financial interest trying to paint it in a bad light. But there, but there are ecological concerns with Ethereum. Um, and so I, I took a pause and I wanted to make sure that I, I do my Genesis drop correctly and that it's eco-conscious um, because most of the NFTs I'm doing are going to have a ecological nonprofit aspect to, tied to them okay. in the smart contract. Okay. Um, and so, but there are really exciting things happening um, with Tezos and some eco-friendly minting options. Okay. So basically... Um, if I, I want to explain NFTs in the most simple terms for your audience that might be unaware, yeah. um, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Um, the counterpart to that is an FT, a fungible token. Yeah. So the easiest way I know to explain is by explaining the fungible token. Fungible just means it's um, interchangeable, exchangeable. So a, a dollar bill or a Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, each dollar bill is worth a dollar bill and each Bitcoin is worth exactly whatever every other Bitcoin is worth. So you can interchange them. They're interchangeable yep. and you can break them down into units to easily trade them. An NFT is a non-fungible token. So it's non-interchangeable. It's a unique token. Um, and some people are confusing it saying like, oh, NFTs are a piece of art or a piece of music. Well, in reality, it's, it's a smart contract that is unique. So Right now, a lot of artists and musicians are posting NFTs that are either um, JPEGs or short animations or a little clip of audio. Um, mm -hmm. But in the future, uh, for instance, researchers will use this technology to make NFTs out of their research okay. so that researchers can collaborate without fear of losing the, the value that they've inputted. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, I think in, in the easiest terms, I would say it's a token that's on the blockchain that's non-interchangeable. It's completely unique. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, I, I, I do understand that and, you know, I'm excited about that, especially um, legacy art. You always hear about this being stolen, that being stolen, right? So there is, yeah. lend some security to this for sure, being on the blockchain. Yeah, yeah. there's that aspect of it that it's kind of like... Um, the person isn't buying the JPEG itself, right? Because anybody can copy and paste it and, and have that JPEG. The person is buying a proof of authenticity. So it's like a certificate of authenticity token that's decentralized. Right. Um, and that's what the people are buying into is being a part of history, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I do. Cause I, you know, I'm like my son, um, when he had gone to, um, uh, University of, um, what is it, John? Oh my gosh, I should know. State College of Florida for graphic design. He did very well. And so I called him up and go, okay, you need to, you need to collaborate with me. I need you to make some NFTs for Kate. He goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I didn't know your son was an artist. I would love to. Yeah. He goes, forever. why? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm like, hey, please. I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to collaborate with him too. Honestly, I think the, um, the most exciting thing about this whole space is the ability to collaborate. So yeah. I know when I, I started to look into this, I um I asked my brother for some help. He's a lawyer in New York. Okay. And I wanted to know some issues around like pop art and if some of these oh. people were gonna get in trouble for you know posting their pop art and maybe having like photographers um, come after them. Oh, okay. And he, he sent me some really interesting cases in, including one that was just decided on and then reversed, which was, um, Goldstein uh, versus the Andy Warhol Foundation. Okay. Um, now in this case, I side with the photographer because Andy Warhol took a photograph from this Goldstein and did very minimal remixing of it, did like a series of 12. And some of them were just kind of like, 
it, it was just the photograph, right? Andy didn't really do any work. And then he sold those pieces for a lot of money. Oh, so she, wow. I've she, never heard this. Wow. Yeah. So she sued the foundation okay. um, and they are notoriously cutthroat and they have a lot of money and they represent big interest. Okay. Um, so in the end, the courts decided against the photographer, even though she was clearly in the right. Yeah. Um, and she was out millions of dollars in court fees. Interesting. Um, yeah. But recently this case, it was overturned. Okay. They found in favor of the photographer. Um, and then literally a day later, my brother sent me a case and he's like, but this other court case just decided the other way around in some other case. So like, who knows? Oh, that, wow. Yeah. That's what, I should it's, think it's the original, you know, content creator. Yeah. And, you know, there this the whole um, like parody, people that do parodies of, yeah. of brands yeah. and stuff like that whole copy law is very case by case and really difficult. And um, this whole NFT marketplace, honestly, is going to force regulators to figure out some new things really quickly because not only do we not have a clear idea of what the law is, even is, um, this is now going to make it like an international thing where internationally we have to agree upon these copyright issues. Nick. And right away, but I had some concerns about the ecological component. Um, so I initially was talking with, and I'll probably still work with um, Project Arc. If you look them up on Instagram, it's just we are Project Arc. Oh, okay. And okay. their whole idea is kind of creating like an open seas of ecology and a marketplace for NFTs that is carbon neutral. Um, Got you. Okay. Much like, see, I'm in, I have, you know, I, I don't know if you heard, I'm in the, I was in the solar industry and that's what I originally went to college for. And there, back about 10 years ago, there was a huge thing about buying and selling carbon um, credits. So yeah. when I heard that ecological thing, my mind ex immediately went to that, you know, the, uh, the yeah. carbon offsets. So I'm wondering if maybe that, that'll get there in the yeah, and space. He, I think they just dropped their first artist like last week. Wow. So I know this is, this is brand new and he had some really exciting, um, he, he said he was working with Binance and Chainlink to promote it. Wow. So I think okay. he, he has some big players in the game. Um, and I look forward to talking with him about Tezos, too, because when we had our conversation, um, the cheap minting, ecologically friendly options weren't quite yet developed. Gotcha. Um, so I don't know what direction they're going to take. But I do know that he was initially thinking Ethereum and then they would buy carbon credits to offset and, and do, you know, projects to plant trees. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, so I think, um, yeah, my, my whole idea is I want to utilize this NFT space to do a lot of collaborative work with other artists. I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, with the smart contract, you can put in a percentage that each involved party gets of the royalties mm -hmm. for life. Um, and I think that's, that's really something that um, we should be using and taking advantage of now to work in new ways that we couldn't before. Right. Um, so I'm pushing the eco aspect. Um, I've started um, I've started a couple of different coins on BitCloud. One of them is called Watercoin, and that's <laughs> going to be um, it's just going to be an information feed okay. that basically informs people, and then has a link at the top of several nonprofits that they could donate directly to. Um, so I've decided not to try to get involved with starting the nonprofit itself, but just kind of informing people um, through that social network. And I think um, I've been doing a big kind of uh, water is life uh, series oh, with my okay. artwork. Um, so there's a nonprofit called water is life that provides wa uh, life straws to some of the poorest nations in the world. Um, so I'd like to reach out and work with them. I haven't confirmed that yet. So fingers crossed they, they respond. Um, but I am part of a, um, a, a auction that's going to be going on this coming up month. If you go to art for reform, either on Instagram or .com, um, they are working with two different institutions and basically the idea is um, a whole bunch of artists donate an original artwork and then they're auctioned off online in an online gallery setting and then all the money goes to these charities. Ah, um, that's very cool. And Art for Reform works with a couple of different ones. I'm trying to find right now which, which these water projects are. I know there's two. Um, it looks like 
Glass Half Full NOLA and Ocean okay. Conservancy. Um, so what they do is kind of like each time they do an auction, it's for a different nonprofit. Um, and this time around, it was ocean conservation. So I, I jumped right in and I had to be part of it. That's all. I see that's right up my alley. And it's anything about, you know, helping um, humanity. That's, you know, what it's um, what really um, I'm passionate about in more ways than one. And, and that's why I'm not a social worker. because <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'd probably burn out pretty quickly. But you know, yeah. any any kind of um, functionality to to just help one another, whatever it is, you know, whether it's water or, you know, social justice, criminal justice. And um, and I'm not sure if you were in the room when I when I did explain how life and stories, you know, came about, but it was through through a um, criminal injustice that someone tried to um, get me involved. And, and I, you know, it worked out and I just love hearing um other people's stories and what they're doing out there and, you know, and creativity and anything that just gets uplifts us. Let's put it that way. You know, anything that yeah, uplifts well, humanity. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I thank you for um, providing this platform and service because I do yeah. think um, I do think it's important for a lot of my life. I've kind of been month to month and I wasn't able to focus on helping others. But um, n now that I'm doing better, I am trying to do some nonprofit work and also um, scoop up some really uh, cheap originals from these amazing artists I know that haven't blown up yet. Yeah. Um, there's a few pieces like on my tours, I would always meet these great artists, but I could never afford their work. And there's a couple of paintings I almost bought for super cheap that I really regret now yeah. because the artist has since blown up and it's like, I can't even afford a print of the image of the original I almost owned. Um, but I do, I really appreciate this platform. And I think that um, largely we all emulate each other. So the more we can see people doing good work, the more we'll do it ourselves. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just truly believe that. I think it's so easy to see, like if we just give minor incentives to people to be their their best selves, and then we, we do it on our own and show them by example, like that's where everything's gonna lead, so. No, I agree. So just to recap, where can um, people find you and your art yeah i think the easiest way would probably be instagram or my link tree um okay. link tree is just uh l-i-n-k-t-r dot e e and then it's mm -hmm. slash high leg art um but if you if people were to just type in high leg art into a google search i'm on all the social media Yay! platforms and including the newly upcoming ones so yeah. I've got to get my link tree done. I really, I'm going on vac vacation kind of tomorrow and uh, I usually do an annual trip with a good friend of mine in, in out in Louisiana and we always make a stop in New Orleans and um, and it's funny stories. I brought back a piece of art a few years ago and you know it looked like a Polak and my son's like how much you pay for that mom? I go forty dollars. He goes I could have done that in two seconds. I'm like whatever because <laughs> it was so I was in a gallery and it just spoke to me and I bought it. <laughs> hey, no, that's awesome though. I think uh, another thing I really love to preach to everybody is to um, to spend your money at yes. little shops and buying original art. Anything that wasn't made with a mold, either in a foreign country, yes. like not to, I'm fine with doing business with foreign countries too, but yeah, buy handmade stuff. Buy yes. from a, a handmade creator from another country. That's cool. Yep. Um, yeah, we do. Um, we have, well, before COVID, we had a lot of um, creative classes at Kate and we are starting them back up and we're so excited. And, um, and I just, you know, just a creative outlet, um, not only for people who are struggling, you know, with their mental health, but just in general, um, anything creative just uplifts, uplifts humans. But well, thank you so much for hanging out with me for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. and um, this this will um, from those of you listening, as you know, I've got a YouTube channel, so you can find um, if you want to be lazy, you can find all of his links on my YouTube channel, yeah. or you can just Google him, and um, you'll find all about him. And thank you so much for for uh, speaking with me. And again, this is Tina McGlynn, and it was with Life and Stories with um, Helig Art Helig. I feel like I got to put a he he. Tell me, tell it to me again. He it could be he but high leg is usually high leg. That's it. Uh, honestly, it's also if you're Jewish, then it's Helig. Yes. So there's yeah. there's a bunch of ways to pronounce it. Uh, anything works for me, and it was my uh, supreme pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful.